It's hard to believe that this happened only two days ago. This time, I was in the first attack echelon. The units were silently pulling up to their positions, talking in whispers. The wheels of the assault guns creaked. Two nights before we had reconnoitered the terrain. Now we waited for the infantry. The infantrymen approached in dark, ghostly columns and moved forward through fields of cabbage and cereal grains. We marched with them to act as the 2nd Battalion's artillery liaison unit. In a potato field, the command, in trench, was received. Number 10 battery was to open fire at 03.05. 03 3.05. First salvo. At the same moment everything around came to life. Fire all along the front. Infantry guns, mortars. Watchtowers rush and disappeared in flashes of fire. Shells rained down on the enemy's batteries, whose location had been established long before the attack. Goose and deployed infantry rushed forward. Swamp, ditches, boots full of water and mud. Over our heads from position to position a barrage of fire. Flanathrowers advanced against the strongholds, machine gun fire, and the piercing whistle of bullets. My young radio operator with forty pounds of load behind him felt somewhat weakened for the first half hour. Then at the barracks at Kanopki, we were given our first serious resistance. The advance chains were jammed, assault guns forward. We were with the battalion commander on a small high ground, five hundred meters from the barracks. Our first casualty was one of the messengers. Only we established radio contact, as suddenly we were shelled from the nearby barracks. Sniper. It was the first time we took up our rifles. Although we were communicators, but we must have shot better. The sniper's shooting stopped. Our first prey. The offensive continued. We advanced quickly, sometimes clinging to the ground, but unstoppable. Trenches. Water. Sand, sun, changing positions all the time. Thirsty, no time to eat. By 10 o'clock we had already become experienced soldiers who had seen a lot. Abandoned positions, overturned armored vehicles, the first prisoners, the first killed Russians. At night we sat in a trench for three hours. From the flanks we were threatened by tanks. Again our advance was preceded by barrage fire. On either side of us were the attacking battalions. Very close. There were bright flashes. We were right in the line of fire. The first burned village, of which only chimneys remained. Here and there, barns and ordinary wells. This is the first time we've been under artillery fire. The shells make an unusual singing sound. We have to quickly dig in and burrow into the ground. Constantly changing position. We lower our equipment to the ground. The reception, unlike yesterday, was good, but barely had time to receive the report as the battalion moved on. We rushed to catch up with it. About three hours passed through a line of trenches, a march between the swamps. Suddenly, a stop. Someone commanded, anti-tank guns forward. The guns whizzed past. Then on the way, a sandy space covered with thickets of rachidnik. It stretched for about two kilometers to the main road and the river at the fortress of Osovitz. For breakfast we had a piece of bread. For lunch, one rusk for four of us. Thirst, heat, and that damned sand. We tiredly trudged along, taking turns to carry the load. Water squelched in my boots, mud and sand clogged them, my face was covered with two-day stubble. At last, the battalion headquarters on the edge of the plain. Up by the river is our outpost. The Russians know exactly where we are. We're quickly entrenched. Not too fast. God knows. We already know exactly when a shell is coming, and I can't help laughing when we burrow into our holes, huddling on the ground like Muslims at Namas. But finally, a good little bit at a time, the infantry pulls back. We roll up our equipment and during a pause in the shelling we make a dash. Others run to our right and left, and we all plow into the dirt at the same time. I can't help laughing. Having reached a relatively safe place, we concentrated in a trench and waited for darkness. We split the last of our cigarettes between us. The mosquitoes went absolutely crazy. 
More signals started coming in. I almost went crazy deciphering them because my flashlight attracted even more mosquitoes. Once again, there were infantry returning from the firing line. We didn't quite know what was going on. We knew there had to be a high ground somewhere. A deep trench. There was soup and coffee waiting for us there, as much as we wanted. Walking at dusk for another two kilometers, we completed the raid at one of our batteries. Soon we were already lying next to each other, pulling our jackets over our ears. The Russian shells wished us good night. When we crawled out again about four o'clock, we found that we were within a hundred yards of our headquarters. An hour later, we were marching westward, then northward. When night fell, we were near the village of Augustov, whose church with its two domes reminded me of my father. A little farther from Avgustov, in the direction of Grodno, we were again declared on alert. We were to be ready by half-past eleven. We were awakened at half-past one, and finally got out at five o'clock in the morning. The situation was changing all the time. The front was approaching very fast. We were on the march to Grodno, where we were to be thrown into battle. Swamps were coming up on the right and left. A whole tank brigade of Russians, presumably somewhere on the right, but that sort of thing you never see. Finally in the evening we entered the village by country roads and followed the same roads through Lipsk. Everywhere clubs of dust rose into the air and slowly billowed behind the columns along the roads. The road to Kuznitsa is all covered with sand, broken, rutted, and full of shell craters. It slopes downward like the bottom of a dried-up sea. With difficulty we cross the slopes by forced march, sometimes the way winds in a snake. It must be like the Napoleonic campaign. At night we stop somewhere among the sands. It's fresh and it's raining. We, shivering, crawl under the vehicles. In the morning we continue on our way, dirty and dusty, with trickles of dripping sweat. Forge. On the sides of the narrow road on which we are pacing are three cemeteries, Catholic, Orthodox, and Jewish. The first on our way is an Orthodox church with its onion domes. Meanwhile, the monotonous plain was replaced by a lovely park-like landscape. Gardens spread around the houses, a modest claim to beauty, unpretentious decorations on the houses and fruit trees. The place was partially destroyed. An entire neighborhood burned down. One of the houses survived with a kitchen and a piece of chimney. A man and a woman are crawling around it, and smoke is coming from this corner. An old man in a tulip with bare feet sits on a chair, smiling happily at us. His red liquor-loving nose stands out against his liquid, unkept beard. After an hour we came out on a decent hard road, moving toward Nin. The light artillery was coming with us. The horses and guns approaching the top of the rise we had crossed looked like paper cut-out figures. It was not hot. Slightly hilly plain, and no dust. A lovely morning. The thatch-roofed wooden houses may have been dilapidated, but the village church was white, and shone on the hill a visible symbol of its power. This march is more tiring than the battle. An hour and a half's rest, from an hour and thirty minutes to three. Later in the march, the moon was at our backs as we headed toward the dark, threatening sky. It was like stepping into a dark hole. The ghostly landscape was faded and bare. We slept like dead people for an hour and got up on unsteady legs with a terrible heaviness in our stomachs. A gentle morning. Pale, beautiful colors. Waking up slowly and sleeping at every rest stop. At any time as you advance, you can see soldiers sleeping by the side of the road where they have sunk to the ground. Sometimes they are curled up like the dead or like a couple of motorcyclists I saw this morning, happy to be on their own back to back, resting in their long overcoats and steel helmets, legs spread and hands in their pockets. The thought of getting up hardly penetrated through the stupefaction of sleep. It took me a long time to wake up. When I woke my neighbor, he continued to lie in a reclined position with a completely lifeless face. I walked over to another doing sentry duty. He had deep wrinkles on his face and feverishly glittering eyes. Another had begun to write a letter to his girlfriend and had fallen asleep while doing so. I carefully pulled out the sheet. He couldn't write three lines. July 13, 
1941. We moved at 4.30 p.m., just before a thunderstorm. We were sweating terribly. The thunderstorm came in a rumbling shroud. It was a relief, but the stuffiness did not disappear. For four hours we walked at an incredible pace without stopping. Even after that we were cheated every time we stopped to rest. We moved on almost immediately. As night fell we were given only three quarters of an hour's rest. Night. From the hill where we stood we could see lights scattered far on the horizon. At first I thought it was dawn. Yellow dust hung around like fog, lazily spreading apart or enveloping the roadside shrubbery. As the sun rose in a red ball on the horizon, we had a pulling power problem. In the faint light, the van of our aerial radio observation point, a giant on huge wheels that had once served as a field forage house for the French, came off the log deck of the road. The horse got tangled in the harness, and the other two, which had been led along the planking ahead to cut a path, got bogged down and tangled in the field communication wires. What a bloody mess! With the help of fresh horses and another pair to assist them, we recovered the stranded wagon and hurried after our unit. We found our own sooner than we expected, a few kilometers ahead, in the woods by the lake. The entire forest was filled with troops and stacks of ammunition, taking up every available space down to the last square meter. We warmed up lunch and set up the tent, and when we crawled inside, it started to rain. Raindrops seeped through a small hole in the tarpaulin top, hitting me in the face, but the weather was still sweltering, so I liked it. Besides, I was really tired. Went down to the lake in the morning. The water was warm. I had time to wash my underwear, which had already taken on a gray earthy color. July 16. We continued on our way at 2 p.m. We walked until our knees trembled all the way to Point L. It was quite near, and we were terribly thirsty. In the village one of our horses lost a horseshoe. A thunderstorm had broken out, and I delayed with the others to find a blacksmith in one of the batteries following behind. Our own blacksmith had stayed far behind to fix a field kitchen that had a broken rear axle. We found the blacksmith. Some of the boys gave us bread, tea, cigarettes, and cigarette paper, and we rode into the thickening dusk and a new thunderstorm. The horses kept prancing from side to side, unable to distinguish the path. Finally, after an hour, we came to the heavy silhouettes of the guns at the edge of the road, straggling the way from the unit. In the rain, dark figures lounged by the machines or lay beneath them in strange-looking piles. I found all my companions lying under the trees. They were sound asleep, and the horses bowed their heads on each other's necks. Between five and six o'clock in the morning, we reached our appointed resting place in a meadow just above one of the villages. Rising was at noon. At four o'clock we were on the road. Four hours of marching in wet boots. By evening it was getting chilly. The road rose and fell in a monotonous landscape, and from afar came the noise of firing. Bomb craters could be seen by the roadside. By 2.20 we turned onto an area overgrown with grass. It was cold and damp in the otherwise penetrating wind. We gathered wet hay and made a tent. Someone had a candle. Now that we crawled inside, it was suddenly quite cozy. Four people, comfortably sheltered around a friendly warm light. Someone said, We won't forget this evening, and everyone agreed. July 20, 1941 Today is exactly four weeks old. Since we crossed the German border, we have traveled 800 kilometers. After Kolm, 1,250. On the 18th night, the exact distance from the crossing at Stanken, where we were assembled to move toward Grave and Osodik, was 750 kilometers. I am sitting on a bench at the ferryman's hut. We were waiting for the others from our unit to begin the difficult crossing of the western Vina River, which our small group traveled on horseback for over an hour. Designed for a load of eight tons, the one-way emergency bridge could not accommodate the entire stream of crossers. At the foot of the steep bank, crowds of prisoners of war helped build the second bridge. Barefoot civilian men huddled over the wreckage of the old bridge that spanned the small river. It may take many hours to cross, 
the hands of 150 prisoners to push are at our disposal. The city of Vitebsk is all in ruins. Traffic lights hang from the streetcar wires like bats. A face on a movie poster still smiles from the fence. The population, mostly women, wander busily between the ruins looking for charred boards for a fire or abandoned utensils. Some streets on the outskirts remain intact, and every now and then, as if by magic, a surviving small shack is found. Some of the girls are dressed quite nicely, though sometimes they are wearing fufages, carrying bags in their hands, and walking barefoot and with a knot behind their backs. There were peasants from the countryside. They have sheepskin tulips or cotton jackets, and women have shawls on their heads. On the outskirts live workers, idle young men and women with insolent faces. Sometimes you are amazed at the sight of a man with a beautifully shaped head, and then you notice how poorly he is dressed. The order to continue our march was cancelled at the last moment. We stopped and loosened the harness. Then, when we were about to give the horses a quarter of their oats, a new order came. We were to move out immediately, on a fast march. The crossing was cleared for us. We moved back, first to the south, in the main direction to Smolensk. The march turned out to be peaceful, it is true, through heat and in dust, but only for eighteen kilometers. But after the light day before, the strain and fatigue made me forget the beauties of the landscape. We were attached to an infantry division, which was advancing still farther eastward. And indeed we paced day and night, and still do. Before us lay fields of quietly swaying corn, acres of fragrant clover, and in the villages a string of weather-beaten thatched huts, a white towering church, which had been used for other purposes, and today might well have housed a field bakery. You can see the locals lined up at our bakery for bread, led by a smiling soldier. You can see the questioning looks of the prisoners who take off their caps under the strict gaze of the convoy. All this can be seen, but only in a semi-drowsy state. At 2.00, I woke up the forward group, half an hour later. The whole detachment. At half past five, we set off. It is now half past six in the evening of July 26. I am lying sweaty and dusty on the roadside at the foot of a hill. From here we have a long open stretch of road to traverse. In the distance a rumbling can be heard. After Suraj intensified aviation, whole squadrons of our dive bombers, escorted by fighters, raided the enemy. Yesterday three Russian bombers circled over our lake after dropping their bomb load a few kilometers from here. Before they were out of sight, we saw our fighter planes whistling after them, landing on their tails, and machine guns zipping in the hot midday air. A few days ago, we came across more and more refugees, then the roads became less busy, and we passed the displaced persons camps, with from a thousand to a thousand two hundred prisoners. Here is nothing less than the front line. In the villages, a great number of houses are abandoned. The remaining peasants carry water for our horses. We take onions and small yellow turnips from their vegetable gardens and milk from their bidons. Most of them willingly share it all. We continued along the road, keeping to our intervals. Far ahead, at the edge of the forest, mushroom-shaped puffs of smoke from shell explosions were rising. We turned, before we reached this spot, onto a quite bearable sandy road that seemed to have no end. Night had fallen. To the north, the sky was still light. To the east and south, it was illuminated by two burning villages. Over our heads, bombers scoped out targets and dropped bombs along the main road behind us. My riders were shaking and swaying in their saddles on their horses. At half past four, we began to hustle. At four, our van hurried to the command post. It was now seven o'clock, and I lay here, somewhat behind him with two unfolded sections of radio at the ready. It's a quiet atmosphere in the afternoon hours. We woke and ate, went to bed again, and then were raised on alarm. The alarm turned out to be false, and we continued to sleep. Down below across the meadow the captured Russians were being ferried to the rear under convoy. In the evening light everything seemed so friendly. It had been a fine day. At last we have a little time for our personal affairs. The war goes on intermittently. 
no decisive action. An anti-tank gun or tank opens fire. We respond with our mortars. The cannon makes unpleasant sighing noises. Then after a few shots, silence. Our batteries are shelling the enemy observation post with intense fire, and the Russians treat us with a few shells. We are chewing our bread and leaning over when the music starts to play. We can tell in advance where it is coming from. Up on the hill, the adjutant reports, the tanks are attacking in three columns along the front. Herr Hauptmann, tell the artilleryman, replies the captain and calmly finishes shaving. About three quarters of an hour later, the tanks are coming at us en masse. They are so close that they come in the rear of our hill. The situation becomes quite tense. The two observation posts fold up and leave. The squad command post and battalion headquarters remain. Meanwhile, our infantry has again advanced toward the burning village, unlying in a crater on a hill. In situations like this, there is always the satisfaction of seeing what separates the grain from the chaff. Most feel fear, only a few remain cheerful, and those are the ones you can count on. July 30, 1941 Last night we saw the light signal that ours about 20 kilometers from here. The ring around Smolensk is shrinking. The situation is getting calmer, mainly because of the slow advance of German infantry over difficult terrain. A significant number of Soviet troops actually avoided encirclement. With their help, a line of defense was erected on the Desna, which thus put the advancing Germans to their first real test. Retreating, the Russians set fire to their villages behind them. The fires blazed all night. Up to noon today, we had an opportunity to see fountains of mud being kicked up by the bursting of heavy shells. The Army Corps is engaged in fighting, moving from south to north. The enemy put up a desperate resistance. Flying shells whistled again in the woods. Toward evening, we were ready to change position, moving eastward. The cauldron of encirclement was about to be broken. When darkness fell, we descended from the hill and rolled 12 kilometers east on the highway. It was a wide, well-maintained road on which there were turned tanks and trucks here and there. We are heading straight to the middle of the cauldron, to the new front, which is already visible on the horizon. We have been marching all night. The fire of two blazing villages toftly reflected on the bluish-gray cloudy ridge, all the time broken by menacing flashes of explosions. All night long there was a low rolling rumble. Then in the morning the cloud bank took on a pale pinkish-purple hue. The colors were strangely beautiful. Gradually, the drowsiness left our bodies, and we were ready for action again. Steel helmets and overcoats were taken out. In two hours we were to be ready for battle. The attack was scheduled for 6.00. 19.00 the end of the day's turmoil. Through the small field of view, it is impossible to get a general picture, but it seems that the Russians instantly cut off our supply road and put considerable pressure on our flank. At any rate, we were rapidly retreating along the road which had hitherto been so quiet. Very near we saw our batteries firing ahead, which were shelling the hillside and the village with brazened, percussion, and delayed action shells. At the same time, the shells of infantrymen were flying from all sides with a whistling sound. Having put our vehicles in a hollow, we went to the edge of a small forest, which was full of staff officers. Even there, we were not to stick out unnecessarily. At such times, I am not curious. You can't see anything anyway. And in any case, it didn't matter to me how far they cut into our flank. I knew that when they came within a sufficient distance, we would still have a chance to have a word with each other. Until then, I was picking strawberries and lying on my back with my steel helmet pulled over my face, a position in which one can get a good night's sleep with as much cover as possible. We were within a few meters of the general and our division commander. It is amazing what situations top officers can find themselves in on a blurred front like this. Meanwhile, our infantry is calming the woods ahead of us. Our tanks are attacking Russian tanks, Reconnaissance planes are flying over positions, and artillery is preparing the way for the infantry. Three Russian planes managed to drop bombs on our positions half an hour ago, but our fighter planes sat on their tails, 
and they couldn't get very far. Recounting the events of August 4 will not be easy, especially when we are on the march. A sentry called me over and told me I had to work with the 7th Company Radio Communications Section. The sergeant and three others with him went to look for the company. They were in a neighboring village, and we moved with them. The only difference between us was that the infantrymen wore light hiking uniforms while we had a set of equipment. The gear was hot and tight-fitting. We didn't have much combat contact with the enemy, but we struggled to walk six to eight kilometers through meadows, picking our way through low shrubs. Perfect terrain for a game of hide-and-seek. We crossed the post road. After another two kilometers, we were fired on from a grove where, according to reports, there should have been no one. Active action began. Gas cannons, anti-tank and assault guns entered the fray. Four Russian tanks appeared, three of which were quickly hit. One of them came in on our left flank from the village of Leshenko and harassed us for some time. My company commander and I were in a small hollow and came under sniper fire, so we could not stick our noses out of our hiding place. There were shouts. Enemy tank ahead. A Russian, hurrah, was heard from the left. It sounds odd, that battle cry, and there is an awkward fidgetiness. If you don't know what is happening 500 meters away, you turn your ears, listening to the intensification and silencing of the noise. Recognizing the difference between the sound of our machine gun bursts and those of the enemy, the Russian machine guns have a muffled coughing sound, while ours produce high-pitched clicks. The attack was repulsed, and we tried to contact our command post. So far, the communication had been excellent. Now it suddenly broke down. We were sitting too low in our hollow. Until we could get higher, we would have to abandon the attempt. Night had descended and the firing was still going on intermittently. We could not go back because the situation on the road leading to the rear was unclear. We stayed where we were and looked at the burning village of Leshenko. The fire opened by our own troops was indiscriminate and caused more Russians to rise from their positions when it became hot to stay there. It is a brutal way of doing things, but it is impossible to do anything else. Somehow by itself from this point, the battle became decidedly fiercer and more ruthless on our side as well, and only one who has been here will understand why. Two other events occurred during the night, the cost of which was to us two killed and one severely wounded. I now know the meaning of the word fearlessness. In the morning, when we woke up, we were greeted by a pleasant silence. Not a single shot fired. Coffee came on and the switchboard operator was just telling the guys at the observation post, no planes in sight yet, and the artillery has left us alone. When we heard a whistle and an explosion, the first shell fell about 200 meters to the right. The lieutenant reprimanded himself, as if the unsuspecting operator had drawn the Russians' attention to us, and we laughed. After that it was quiet, hardly a shot fired, except for something that happened in the middle of the afternoon when I went out on the road to show the forage cars the way to the command post. It was then that our old friend the tank thundered into the neighborhood. Ugly red flames with black smoke erupted, and there was a pop of gunfire. It's weird. As soon as we are drawn into a new battle and hear the thunder of cannons, we become happy and carefree. Every time this happens, our guys start singing, become cheerful, and get in a good mood. The air is filled with a new smell of freedom. Those who like danger are the good guys, even if they don't want to admit it. Every now and then, a shell flies off one of the batteries. It makes a sound like a ball tossed very high into the air. You can hear it fly farther away. Then sometime after the whistling stops, the distant thud of its bursting is heard. The Russian shells have a very different sound like the rattle of a heavily slammed door. This morning intense shelling was heard somewhere in the distance, and so it has been very quiet since yesterday. The Russians must have realized how weak their attacks were. They must be watching our supply lines for a sudden attack from the rear. We can wait. We can watch this quietly, just as we watch them dig trenches designed to protect the approaches to Point White. It's a strange war. Last night I went up as an aide with Arno Kirchner. It takes a whole hour to get from the command post to the observation post. 
a light mist hung between the trees, and the grass and shrubbery were heavy with rain. We groped our way along the trail past ravines and slopes to Monastersky. There was a road there. Everywhere there was a ghostly silence. The front was perfectly quiet, except for the upward surge of isolated flickering flashes that shone lonely white as chalk in the gloom that swallowed up all sound. In the village we could see streaks of light from cellars and dugouts. Somewhere the light of a cigarette glowed furtively, a silent sentry shivering with cold. It was late, nearing midnight. The puddles in the shell craters reflected the stars. Hasn't all this happened before? I thought. Russia, Flanders, soldiers on the front line. Sometimes a painting puzzles you in a similar way. You think, it must have been like this before in the previous war. Now it's the same, time has been erased. We were in a hurry and only interjected a few remarks to each other, pointing to the craters. Spokes and wheels in the ditch, the remains of a local wagon. A direct hit, Arno said dryly. What else is there to say? It's a bloody road leading straight to the enemy, to White. Be careful, we must be near a junction, then another fifty meters. We scrambled through wires and communications trenches. Finally our soldier appeared with a radio and a telephone receiver ten meters away. The guys stood around, shivering from the cold, up to their chests in the wet trench, each with a raincoat over his shoulder. I relayed the order to wrap up over the phone. We changed the radio transmitter, and I tried to make contact. I slipped into the wet trench, the loose and water-soaked walls of which were covered with rotting straw, and found a narrow spot that was dry. It required some skill to squeeze through, with the legs squeezing through first. Halfway down the ceiling had caved in. The side walls were not thick enough to resist vibration. The trench was very cramped. As a precaution I shoved my steel helmet and gas mask under the two thickest rungs, but as the trench was narrower at the bottom than at the top, the danger of being buried alive was not too great. It is true that the ceiling collapsed when someone walked through the trench, but I pulled the blanket over my head and, listening once more to what was going on outside, fell asleep peacefully. Our unit was part of the Ninth Army, which covered the left flank of the 4th Tank Army. The latter had advanced seventy kilometers to the northeast, roughly in the direction of the capital, and then suddenly struck a blow in a northerly direction to Kalinin. It began to rain in the morning and was still raining when we moved at one o'clock. A fine drizzle of low clouds, the landscape gray and mossy, like the Westerwald sometimes is in the fall. We barely dragged ourselves through wet meadows and over waterlogged roads with our two cars. Somewhere we came upon a battery again, and the long column moved forward with difficulty. The cars bumped and slid, slid and stuck. The gun carriage had fallen into the ditch and was still there by the next morning. When it got dark, we found a sort of dugout that housed a temporary command post. There we crawled around trying to get settled. By the time that was over with, our overcoats were hard from the wet sand and clay. We found a dugout with a manhole as big as the entrance to a rabbit hutch. I groped my way inside and fumbled for a niche covered with straw. My hand touched someone's belt. I thought, this will fit me just fine. Then I stacked the equipment in various other niches, and when I returned a little later, there was already light in the dugout. The light in the narrow window looked cozy against the rain. Inside I found two liaison men from the 12th Battery who had gotten settled here the day before. There were three in our own team, and there were only four sleeping places here. There was no turning around in this shelter, all taken up by our wet clothes and equipment. But what did it matter? A roof, a smoldering candle, a cigarette, and when there are enough of you, you warm up quickly. Some poured water out of their boots, others prepared to stand guard. Antamon and I went to bed in a huddle, one with his head to the west, and the other to the east. We couldn't turn around. We pressed against each other too intricately for that. Yesterday we spent the whole day repairing the breakages that had occurred in our equipment and armament as a result of this last march. But we had a quiet evening. We stood in front of our dugout like a peasant at the gate of his yard, until the rain drove us inside. 
It is still quiet here in our corner, but the flank, a little to the south, is coming under some heavy gunfire from time to time. The Russians use long-range guns for this purpose. With your hands in your pockets, you look at all this, just as a peasant looks at his potatoes, and says in a connoisseur's tone, they are coming along quite well. There is nothing heroic in all this. You shouldn't use the word in a way that it doesn't mean. We are not heroes. The question is, are we brave? We do what we're told to do. There may be times when you hesitate, but you still go and go steadfastly. That means you don't give a hint. Is that courage? I wouldn't say it is. It's no more than you might expect. You simply don't have to show fear, or, more importantly, you don't have to be gripped by it. After all, there is no situation that a clear, calm mind cannot handle. Danger is only as great as your imagination allows it to be. And since thinking about danger and its consequences only makes you insecure, it is fundamental to self-preservation not to let your imagination get the upper hand. For days on end, and often for weeks on end, not a single bullet or shell fragment flies so close to us that we can hear them whistling. At such times we fry potatoes in peace, and even in the rain the fire does not go out. But even when the whistle blows quite close, the distance between the flying bullets and shells, and us is still quite long. As I said, you just have to stay calm and stay alert. Father understood this very well. I am always happy when I read his letters, and they warm my heart with the feeling that he understood all this by virtue of his own combat experience. It's not so bad at all, is it, Father? Of course, we have to confront different kinds of weapons, but we ourselves have a wide variety of weapons. A tank can be clumsy, going up against you if you have an anti-tank gun. But in the worst case scenario, you can always duck for cover and let it pass you by. And even such a monster is by no means invulnerable to one person, provided you attack it from behind. That's the kind of act, done willingly, that I would call brave. On the whole, warfare has not changed. Artillery and infantry still dominate the battlefield. The increasing combat power of the infantry, its automatic weapons, mortars and all the rest, is not as bad as is believed. But you have to recognize the most essential fact you have another man's life in front of you. This is war. This is commerce. And it's not that hard. And again, because the weapons are automatic, most soldiers don't realize the full significance of this. You're killing people at a distance, and you're killing people you don't know and have never seen. A situation in which a soldier is confronted by a soldier, in which you can say to yourself, this one is mine, and open fire, may be more common in this campaign than in the last one, but it does not arise very often. September 22, 1941. Between 8 and 9 in the evening. We are sitting in the dugout. It's so hot that I strip down to my waist. The flame of our fire is so high and bright that it gives too much heat. It is our only source of light. We all sit on a bench, notebooks in our laps, thinking fondly of home. Hines of his wife expecting a baby, me of you, dear parents, and friends. We want you to know that we have everything perfect in reality, and speaking quite sincerely, in some moments we are perfectly happy, because we know that under the circumstances it can't be better. It is all made by our hands, the bench, the beds, the hearth, and the wood we have made from the debris of the collapsed roof, and brought here to put on the fire. We have brought water, dug potatoes, chopped onions, and hung walks over the fire. There are cigarettes, the field kitchen is making coffee, and the lieutenant has given us this remaining time for a break. We all get together in one friendly company and have a little feast. Heinz is sitting by the fire. I'm listening to music on the radio. He has also thrown off his last of his clothes. He sweats like a frying pan and we grin at each other as we take a break from writing, or looking at the fire, or reaching for our mugs. What do we care if it rains or if there are explosions outside, as long as they are firing 150mm or 200mm guns? We are warm, cozy, as safe as we can be, 
and it is unlikely that anyone will get us out of here. All is quiet on the Eastern Front. Operations are going on as planned. Let them go on. Old boy, we won't follow them. At least not today. When I got up this morning, there was frost everywhere. I found a thick patch of ice in the water bags. Winter is just around the corner. It's the last day of September. The mood is dreary. The sound of a stringed instrument playing makes it even sadder. The flames of bright flames dance. We hang our headphones wherever we can. On protruding roots, rifle sights, violins sound everywhere. Chimneys are blowing in all the dugouts. It's like a whole village filling the small valley with smoke. On each side of the dugout is a sloping cut. You enter it at ground level, and between the two rows of dugouts, there is a distance the width of a narrow alley. You can put one transportation unit there, and it is usually our forage wagon, horse, and wagon. When it arrives, everyone comes out of their crevices. The village comes into motion. Not that it's always quiet during the day, because the boys are chopping firewood and hauling water or returning from hikes for provisions in the potato field. Nor is it quiet in the evenings when they have smoke breaks and conversations, or carry the latest news from dugout to dugout, or crowd around someone who has come in with the latest news. Whatever the news, we come together like pieces of a mosaic. Someone saw tanks, yellow ones, destined for action in Africa. Now they've turned this way. Someone else saw the assault guns, and some of the gas gunners came by mistake. All kinds of special weapons, in great numbers, guns of all calibers, all concentrated in this sector. It accumulates with stern inevitability, like storm clouds. It is a sword over the silence, a breath to strike a blow that may prove more powerful than any we have seen so far. We do not know when it will be struck. We only feel that the veil over the silence is growing thinner and thinner, that the atmosphere is heating up, that the hour is approaching when it will only take a word to spew hell, when all this concentrated force will surge forward, when the rampart of fire will reappear before us, and I shall have to follow the machine guns again. In any case, this is where we will have to crack a nut, and it will be a real nut. 22.00 Nudes on every wave. I turned off the radio to stare at the fire for a moment, watching the ever-mesmerizing play of the flames. Two of my companions have fallen asleep to the music. It was very quiet. Only the fire was flowing, and I took a coal to light one of my Gallic cigarettes, delivered today from Paris. The boys asked me for one. At last a cigarette that has tobacco in it, remarked one of them. And another said, they remind me of France. France, how long ago it was, and how beautiful. How different are these two countries, these two wars, and between them lies an intermediate country to which we hope one day to return. Have I had enough? No. What must be, must be. We must press on with all our energy. Maybe then we can have a few weeks off. It's not the kind of rest we need now. It's okay as long as you're just a soldier, used to minimal needs like food and sleep. But there's another part of us, the ones who wake up at night and render us helpless, all of us, not just me. 6.00, I jump out of the dugout. There are tanks, giants slowly creeping towards the enemy, and airplanes, one squadron after another, dropping bombs along the way. Army Group Center began the offensive. 6.10, First salvo of rocket mortars. Damn it, it's worth watching. The rockets leave behind them a black tail, a dirty cloud that slowly drifts away. Second salvo. Black and red fire. Then a shell bursts out of a conical sheaf of smoke. You can see it clearly as soon as the rocket burns off. That shell flies straight as an arrow in the morning air. None of us have ever seen it before. Reconnaissance planes return. Flying low over the positions, fighter planes are circling overhead. 6.45. Machine gun fire ahead. It's the infantry's turn. 8.20. Tanks are crawling past, very close to the artillery positions. It must have been a hundred, but they keep coming and coming. Where fifteen minutes ago there was a field, now there is a road. 
500 yards to our right the assault guns and motorized infantry are moving non-stop. The divisions that had been stationed in our rear are now coming through us. The second battery of light guns changes position and crosses the path of the tanks. Tanks stop, then continue to move. At first glance, chaos, but they act with precision, like clockwork. Today they are going to crack the Dnieper frontier, tomorrow it will be Moscow. Armored reconnaissance vehicles join the columns. The Russians now only occasionally open fire. The same picture on our left. Gunners on motorcycles and tanks. The assault is underway. It is much more powerful than the one that was used to storm the border defenses. It will be some time before we see such a picture again. 9.05 The main force has passed. Movement still continues only on our right. A few shells hit the high ground ahead. Some big guy is heading vigorously towards us, taking a long time to get down like the rest of them. I shout to one of our drivers, but he only stupidly opens his mouth in amazement. A moment later there is an explosion behind him. He doesn't know what has happened and makes a face that we can't keep from laughing. 9.45 Now I think we've seen how the last ones went. It's getting quieter. Past 1,200 tanks, not counting the assault guns, along a front of two kilometers. Any war movie pales in comparison. This is a real spectacle, said the boys. Soon from the forward observation post of the 10th Battery reported that the second line of defenses broke through. For 20 minutes we have no longer been shelled here. We were fired on for the last time. We are standing, basking in the bright rays of the morning sun. Radio communication works perfectly. The weather's perfect for an offensive. 10.00 Our first task is accomplished. I am lying sheltered from the wind on empty ammunition boxes, waiting for a new observation point to be chosen so that we can change position. Everyone is gathered in the same company to, to chat and smoke. Medical Sergeant Lurch returns from the front lines. Our forward observation post communicator has been shot in the thigh. Lurch tells us that it's full of mines. Our sappers are pulling them out by the hundreds. Deep trenches and barbed wire. Not many prisoners. 12.30. First change of position. So, here it is the defense line, which we shelled with intense fire. A horribly mangled system of trenches, a strip of torn up earth, funnel on funnel. White ribbons with inscriptions warning of mines have been put up. And these warnings are not serious, as can be seen by the slides of mines prepared for emplacement. The columns move forward through the mushroom-shaped explosions of shells, which from time to time burst suddenly from Russian long-range guns. Or, perhaps, these mushroom-shaped explosions are from mines, which undermine ours. It is difficult to distinguish between these two types of explosions. Over the troops on the march in battle formation flying bombers, then skittish silver fighters, forward to the east. 16.00 Again the old story. The change of position turned into a march. I am writing about it at rest on the roadside, chewing a piece of bread. On the horizon is the same familiar smoke. Once again, as before, we don't know where or when the march will stop. But no matter how, it doesn't matter. On foot or on horseback, we move with frequent halts, onward to the east. We marched in this way until it was dark and the yellow moon rose over the hills, spent a rather cold night in the barn. At first light we set off again. The ice-streaked puddles glistened. Steam rose from men and horses, white and glistening in the rising sun. Amazing shades, like brass balls. Tracer shells highlighted a solitary bomber, and the turquoise sky was colored on the horizon with red fire. Meanwhile, we were informed that we were going into battle. We were to move to a new position behind a hill. Bombers swooping over the position dropped sharply and went overhead. Wounded prisoners were brought in, tanks crawled forward, and the battalion went into action. The artillery liaison unit was in charge of fire support. My ears are ringing from the rumble of artillery, and the headset microphone has pinched the stubble of my beard. I'm writing this sitting in a hollow. Strike. Take cover. Our aerial attracted the fire of some tanks. 
Just as I was about to lower the equipment, a signal came from the fire control center. Target number one has been taken. The battalion is holding off enemy tanks, and the infantry is holding the edge of the forest. Mortars to battle. We opened fire. The targets were as in the palm of our hands. Infantry, anti-tank guns, and a gun tractor. Some of our tanks stuck out too. Squadrons of dive bombers appeared and rushed to attack. The assault resumed. Anti-aircraft gunners and tankers met at our point. The anti-aircraft artillery was about to move out and join in firing on the enemy tanks. We returned hungry and cold and were placed in the linen soaking shed among the lovely silver-gray bales. I spread a few sheaves of flax on the floor and collapsed on them without removing my weapon. I slept like a god. Days passed, and nothing happened. I got myself and my linen in order again. Did a little writing and reading. What a pleasure to have a good book at hand. I read Eichendorf's The Idle Man, a short story by Stifter, and a few passages from Schiller and Goethe. This is another of the bridges built by the war between my father's generation and mine, one of the very small ones. The greatest are the trials experienced during the war itself. How much better we understand each other now, Father. The gulf that sometimes separated us during my growing up years has disappeared. This is a meeting of like-minded people, and it makes me very happy. You spoke of this in one of your letters, and I can only agree with what you say. Nothing binds us more closely together than the fact that we have endured hardships, hardships and dangers, and in fact, we have visited literally the same places, at Augustov, Lida, and on the Berezina. I have traveled to the places of your battles. Now I understand what you told me about because I experienced the same things, and I know what four years in Russia must have been like. Life experience is the best teacher. There was a time when I and people of my generation said yes. We thought we understood. We heard and read about the war and got excited, just as the younger generation today gets excited when they follow the news. But now we know that war is quite unlike any description, however good, and that the most essential things cannot be told to one who does not know it for himself. Between us, Father, we need only touch one string to hit the whole consonants, apply only one stroke of one paint to hit the whole picture. Our communication consists only of lines. Communication between comrades. So that's what we have become, comrades. It is good to walk on the frozen roads of this country, with hills topped with villages. But 55 kilometers is a lot. We spent the time from 8 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock in the afternoon of the next 24 hours on them. And then we found no available quarters for standing. Several houses in our resting place had been distributed long ago. But the boys squeezed into the crowded rooms, determined to stay warm even if they had to stand. I myself crawled into the stables and managed to sleep until seven. At eight, we were on the road again. Walking on this cold winter morning was a pleasure. Clean, spacious country with big houses. The people look at us with awe. There is milk, eggs, and plenty of hay. Lines of geese strutting through the withered grass. We are their undoing because our rations are not improving and the bakery lost contact with us long ago. This morning we followed the wagons, peeling potatoes and plucking chickens and geese. The field kitchen is cooking chickens and rice for dinner tonight, and now, for sheer happiness, we caught geese and dug up potatoes to cook on our stove. The standing rooms are amazingly clean, quite comparable to German peasant homes. At lunch I took a plate and spoon and ate without the slightest hesitation. A further glance was enough and the family was washing our dishes. Everywhere are images of the faces of saints. People are friendly and open. This is amazing to us. On the 13th, we were only going to walk nine kilometers, a morning walk through small wooded valleys, places rather like Spessart Samoy. But the pleasure of returning to our temporary lodgings was short-lived. We had scarcely had time to saddle our horses before the order came to move on. It was a long, painful march over frozen and slippery roads. It lasted almost the whole night. Then we lost the road. 
stood tired and frozen in the wind until we lighted fires and huddled around them. By five o'clock the lieutenant had gone to look for standing quarters in a neighboring village, so that we could rest for a few hours. Winter had not stopped in its entry. Some of the horses still had summer horseshoes, so they kept slipping and falling. Even Thea, the last horse from the original harness of our radio station wagon, stalled out. After much fumbling and capering I managed to get her into the stall of the local stable. The tenth battery got bogged down in the swamp and finally turned back. Things don't seem to be going so brilliantly. I don't like the way the eleventh battery looks either. This means a day of rest for us. We're gathered in a small bakery. Nine of us can barely move our legs. My boots in the morning were still so wet that I could only fit into them barefoot. The house where we are staying is full of lice. Our little wreath was so reckless as to sleep last night on the stove. Now he has picked them up too. And how many? The socks that had been put there to dry were white with lice eggs. We picked up fleas too. Absolutely outstanding specimens. A Russian old man in greasy clothes, to whom we showed these fauna, smiled broadly with his toothless mouth and scratched his head with an expression of sympathy. Mine too. Nick's gut. Not good. Now for a while, I'm still awake when others are already asleep, even if I'm not at my post. I can't sleep that much, and sometimes I need to be alone with myself. The ghostly pale light from the electric bulb falls on the dark divots on the floor, on the equipment, clothing, and weapons that fill the room. When you look at them this way, they are a pitiful sight, gray and gray, as oppressive as a heavy dream. What a country, what a war, where there is no joy in success, no pride, no satisfaction, only a feeling of restrained rage. It's raining and snowing. We are marching along the road to Moscow, then in the direction of Kalinin. There is no need to mention all the houses where we camped, tired and drenched. Though the general impression had changed, more densely populated places began to appear. The villages are more urban, with brick two-story houses and small factories. Most of them have an unassuming rustic look. Only the pre-World War I houses are pleasing to the eye with their intricate wooden ornaments on the windows and the wooden ligature of the roof ridge. With all those eye-catching colors, bright green and pink, blue-blue and scarlet, Quite often curtains and potted flowers on the windows, I saw houses furnished with tasteful furniture, shining clean, with scraped floors, with hand-woven carpets, with white Dutch stoves with copper utensils, clean beds, and people dressed modestly but neatly. Not all houses were like this one, but many were. The people are generally helpful and friendly. They smile at us. A mother told her young child to wave at us from the window. People look out all the windows as soon as we pass by. The windows are often greenish glass, a tribute to Gothic colors, Goya's twilight. In the twilight of these dreary winter days, green or red hues can have a striking effect. October 24, 1941. Since last night we have been in Kalinin. It was a hard crossing, but we made it. We are the first infantry division here and arrived ahead of the two light brigade groups. We marched up the road stretching to this bridgehead like a long arm, without much cover on either flank. The bridgehead must be held for strategic and propaganda reasons. The road bears the imprint of war, wrecked and abandoned equipment, destroyed and burned houses, huge bomb craters, the remains of unfortunate people and animals. The city is the size of Frankfurt, not counting the outskirts. It is a haphazard jumble with no plan or distinguishing features. There are streetcars, traffic lights, modern neighborhoods, hospitals, and government buildings, all mixed in with shabby wooden shacks and huts. The new houses were located on a sandy wasteland, without any fence except a wooden hedge. Following them rose the factory buildings in all their unsightliness, with warehouses and railroad sidings. Yet we rolled along the asphalt roads for an hour, reading quaint names like cooking over restaurants along the way. We watched as the remaining population looted in a hurry. The Russians are still entrenched on the outskirts. Two days ago, their tanks were still refueling in the city. 
They have a sneaky joke of racing through the streets and just hitting our vehicles. We had some unfortunate casualties because of that. When we entered the town, we were confronted with the fact that they had set up their guns on the main road and gave us a great running start. It was a perfect circus. Still, this afternoon eight of the sixteen planes bombing the crowded airfield were shot down. They flew low and crashed, bursting into flames like matchsticks. Since we've let the tanks out, now they'll soon clear us some space to move. It's a strange life on this island in a strange land. We have come and are ready for anything, no matter how unusual it may be, and nothing will surprise us anymore. During the last quarter of an hour there has been a reign of excitement in the sector to our right. The position of the third battery is out of action. The line patrols are ceasing to operate. Outside there is a brutal cold. This is a serious war, serious and sobering. It's probably different from what you imagine it to be. It's not so horrible. Because for us, there's not much horrible left in the things that are considered horrible anymore. Sometimes we say, let's hope it ends soon. But we can't be sure that it will be over tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And we shrug our shoulders and do our thing. I stood alone in the house, lit a match, and bedbugs started falling from the ceiling. Hordes of vermin were crawling on the walls and floor. The hearth was completely black with them, a horrible living carpet. As I stood quietly, I could hear their incessant rustling and rustling. Nothing, it doesn't confuse me anymore. I just wonder and shake my head. November 2, 1941. 16.00. The Russians have been attacking all night. It's calmer today. A wet fog has enveloped the trees, and the crows are shaking off their feathers. Reports that the Russians are planning a big offensive. The calm before the storm. I was down at headquarters all day yesterday fixing my boots. By evening I was back at my position with Franz Wolf. We were pacing, hands in pockets, collars unbuttoned and with pipes in our teeth. As we dragged along like this, leisurely, our waist belts and everything metal became covered with ice, and our collars and pilots became hard with frost. It must have been about half past four when the Russians subjected our positions to a carpet bombardment from their damned guns. This carpet covered the hill in front of us with a series of violently flashing sheaves of fire, running from right to left with one-second intervals between blows. A series of terrible explosions. The sky turned red, and Fran said, Damn it, it was our village again. Since I had nothing left to do, I took the opportunity to visit the radio communications office at Observation Post No. 3. That meant going into the fire. When we arrived at the top of the hill, we began to wonder, was the small house engulfed in fire or not? We looked around at the top and Fran said, here they can always shoot you left and right. Hardly had he finished speaking before we were both already sprawled out on the ground. We laughed with our heads tucked away because Franz had announced shortly before that he wouldn't do it anymore because it looked silly. It's stronger than you. It's instinct, he said, then added. And over there they're firing right down the village street. We did not have to wait long for machine gun fire, and after a few rapid advances by crawling we turned to the right. In the meantime it became clear that it was not the little house that had been hit, but the neighboring barn. Zink's cow was in there. I'll have to tell him about it. We passed through a grassy field, in places pocked by numerous blast craters, and turned onto the village street. Only Wolf's house remained intact on the right. It was a neat little structure, the commissioner's office, with a clean ceiling and whitewashed grafters, a desk and a white Dutch oven, and of course no vermin. No one lived here. Zinc lay on the carpet in front of the radio equipment, an exotic sight in the dim light of the oil lamp. He really had a lot to tell us. The barn had caught fire after the first volley at half past one in the afternoon. Zinc was milking a cow. The explosion threw me back in the hay. After a while I got up, looked at the cow, and the cow looked at me. Then the fire started, and I untied the cow, and took her to safety. After that, I didn't get out all day. Once is enough. In the evenings we talked about serious things, 
about our situation, sharing impressions of our experiences, about the change of character, about our work before the war, and what we would do afterward, about what would happen to us, to Russia and Germany. Then there were jokes, because the guys from the motorized infantry call us the Hungry Division. We are always in difficulty, without a supply echelon, like street children. We don't get new army boots or shirts when the old ones wear out. We wear Russian pants and Russian shirts, and when our shoes are in disrepair, we wear Russian boots and shoelaces, or even make frost earmuffs out of these shoelaces. But we have our rifles and the utmost minimum of ammunition. No, look who's here, say the guys from the motorized infantry. But we have an answer. Our general has nerves of iron. We say, like it or not, this country feeds us. Since five o'clock this morning, it has been snowing again. The wind blows small dry snowflakes into every crevice. The infantrymen protect themselves from the cold with whatever they can. Fur gloves, woolen caps, earphones made of Russian boots and cotton pants. We occasionally stick our noses out and run back to the stove. Poor soldiers from rifle companies, sitting in dugouts and trenches. They don't have a proper fighting position. We haven't got them trained for it. And we haven't got any suitable dugouts dug, although we've been stuck here for a while. We did not intend to linger. We must move forward. The snow falls abundantly and quietly. It is no longer blizzarding so hard now. It absorbs sounds and is blinding. Individual gunshots ring out from the unreal gray haze, sounding deafening. You don't even know why they're firing. Abandoned horses, stallions and old geldings trot through the snow, heads hanging down, appearing out of the gloom and disappearing alone. As we walked across the night-covered plain, the wind blew snow crystals behind our necks, and we hardly spoke. Once Fran said, This is God's forgotten country. Then at a crossroads we said goodbye. As we shook hands, we lingered for a moment, and Fran's a slouching figure quickly disappeared into the darkness. There are moments when a picture sticks in your mind. This was such a moment. As I cast one last glance at the friend I had parted with, I felt disconnected from the event in which I had participated. We never know where we are going, even if we laugh at such thoughts most of the time. I have my overcoat again. We lost Antman. One good comrade is gone. It's an old overcoat, two campaigns old, with a greasy collar and pockets out of shape, just right for Russia, for someone who wants to put his hands deep in his pockets while smoking a pipe in his mouth. A very suitable pose for someone who wants to create a kind of vacuum around him, because each of us has become almost indifferent to everything. I personally feel great in this state. I find pleasure in steeling myself against all these adversities, mobilizing my strength and sobriety of mind against this dog-eat-dog -dog life, so that at the end I may benefit from it. We are now twenty-eight men in this room plus four women and a child. The owners sleep sometimes in the kitchen next door, sometimes here on the stove. My own sleeping place is by the door, in the passage. Since we have a battery radio, we have visitors even in the evening. This creates a whole aisle problem. One can hardly turn around. When most go to bed, I sit down to write, and sometimes we play a game of chess while others take off their shirts in a nighttime lice hunt. That's when the infantrymen strike up a conversation, real infantry soldiers like the machine gunners or the guys in the rifle company. It's hard to describe this kind of evening conversation. There is so much in the very atmosphere of that conversation, in the way people sit with their elbows on their knees or leaning back with their arms bent. Sure, sometimes we get depressed, but we don't need to talk about it because the best in us comes out in humor. For example, we pull out a map and say, now once we get to Kazan, or does anyone know where Asia is? Today someone said, we'll be home for Christmas. He didn't say what year. The other threw in a smirk. Imagine, you get home, and the first thing you know, you're taken into the militia. You get up at five o'clock on a Sunday morning, and somebody's standing there yelling, machine gun fire on the left or 200 meters behind the village, Russian infantry, what are your actions? 
You answer them that you're going into the village to catch a couple of chickens for roasting. Fran says, what else? And Zink adds, if anyone wants to talk to me, I'll ask him if he's been to Russia. Despite the fact that Kalinin was taken, the offensive in the main direction to Moscow was stopped, bogged down, in mud and forests about only 200 kilometers from the capital. Following a new attempt to reach Moscow on December 2, in which the German troops actually reached the suburbs, the Russians launched their first major counteroffensive. Within days, the 9th and 4th Panzer armies were driven far back, and Kalinin had to be abandoned. January 1, 1942. Happy New Year to all of you. We came out of the burning village in the night, and everywhere we passed. Tongues of flame were shooting up into the sky, followed by black puffs of smoke. All the boys were asleep now. I went outside just to wish my sentries a happy new year. Maybe we'll be home again this year, I said. On the morning of the first of the year it was still over forty degrees below zero. We wrapped rags around our boots and looked at each other's noses every now and then. When the tailbone of your nose turns white, it's time to do something about it. Franz and I rode with the front group. There was no way Franz could get into the stirrup because of the rags wrapped around his boots. He took out his gloves to untie the wire that was tied around the rags. Two of his fingers were frostbitten. Some of us had frostbite on our feet, some to the third degree. The Russians are pushing desperately. They are trying to capture the village intact at any cost, but we leave them none. On January 9, we went on horseback to look for a room for the men of our supply echelon. It was already dark. The narrow road track was recognizable only thanks to the deadwood trampled into the snow. We trotted about four kilometers. Every now and then the horses fell belly deep into the snow, jumping out and struggling to hit forward. It was like a camel race. We swayed and balanced, trying to pull our bodies away from the withers and from the horse's rump, helping it to move forward to the best of our ability. It was a strange cavalcade. Three scarecrows among the bushes and hills. Behind them the sky was red again. From time to time there was the sound of gun and rifle fire. But as it was, it was very quiet. An icy wind was blowing. Since last night it had been sweeping the snow outside the town in streaks and tearing it to shreds. Snow had covered the bridge, snow dunes covered all the trails, and deep drifts had piled up on the roads. Now we're waiting for our men. They should approach, having overcome thirty kilometers of the way. Will they be able to do it? 20.00. They can't do it now. It's been dark for hours. At half past five we had already eaten dinner. We looked at the clock and shook our heads. It was still so early, and night had already fallen some time ago. There was snow in the air, ice crystals like gnarled needles, that the wind blew into every crevice. The light on the other side of the village street burns faintly, and if you venture outside, the wind will ruffle your clothes. Better to sit by the fire. Thank God for the potatoes. We were not prepared for a long stay in these parts, and what would have become of us without it? How could the whole army have survived the Russian winter without this humble vegetable? In the evening, as always, we peeled the potatoes from their skins, mashed them reverently and salted them with coarse Russian salt. It's morning now. We finished our breakfast, and again it was the potatoes that made us feel satisfied with the meal. In this house we were offered potatoes, tea, and a loaf of bread kneaded of rye and barley flour with onions added. Perhaps there were a few brown cockroaches in it. At least I cut one down without saying a word. The saint in the corner looks meekly out of his golden frame, as if to say that the impassive spirit pays no attention to such trifles. What good is noticing them? It can only prevent me from savoring the splendor of the creation that reappeared this morning in all its beauty. The first ray of sunlight was a line of green and red fire streaming into the sky. Then a strange light appeared in the northeast. Its center looked like molten metal and was framed by two arcs of such dazzling radiance that it hurt my eyes to look. Everything around was bathed in a magical golden-white haze. The trees and bushes were enveloped in a radiant glow, 
and in the distance the tops of roofs and hilltops shone white against the soft gray horizon. In the dawn the sound spilled out strangely mesmerizing and elusive, as if it were all the magic play of a fairy tale. We galloped back in the bright sunlight. I rode on horseback for the last time with Franz Wolf and my old comrades. I was transferred to a battery. The liaison man is dead. Long live the artillerymen. The Ivans have awakened. We pushed them extremely hard. Now they have repulsed the blow and are on the offensive. Last night we scared away three reconnaissance groups in the battalion sector. The last one consisted of twenty men. Only one of them fell behind the wire on our side. As for the others, in the morning there were many small mounds left strewn over the bodies of the dead along the neutral strip. One of them was still smoldering. He must have had a Molotov cocktail, and one of our tracer bullets hit it. Throughout the night the Russians came in with flamethrowers. Ivan is now using quite a lot of high explosives. In the cold the rumble of explosions is extremely loud. The shrapnel makes a shrill, sharp whistling sound, but the effect is not very great. We are too well protected. The shells of our heavy mortars do much more damage to the Iwan. They bounce off the ground and explode in the air. This achieves much greater killing power from the ricochet effect of an artillery shell, against which no trench will protect. When our Stukas drop their load, the ground shakes for a kilometer around. In one of the companies set up a trench mortar, which is supposed to throw disc mines into Ivan's trenches from a distance of 30 to 40 meters. The design of the mortar resembles the catapult of the Romans. It is very primitive. Such weapons, a generation of trench warfare. When the front begins to move again, these things are quickly forgotten. But this game of Roman toys speaks volumes about the unit's morale. The day before yesterday, I fired a gun for the first time. Ten rounds. It was an amazing feeling. You forget about everything. The danger, the cold. It's a duel. In fact, we were in no danger. Everything was going on as at the range. Our first shell hit near a dugout with soldiers, which we had been watching all day. We fired at two other dugouts. At the third one a fountain of earth went up, as when a mine exploded. That was our farewell shot. After that we withdrew to S, where we had been stationed some time before. From here we have to withdraw to the positions prepared in advance. Yesterday I went to see the old brethren. Franz has finally been awarded the Iron Cross, first class. His service record says, for chasing an enemy tank from point C to the next village and attempting to hit it with an anti-tank gun. We laughed to the point that tears rolled down our cheeks. For that, among all other merits, at a time when he had already received a severe reprimand. All the same, I was glad. I got there just as the squad was coming out for formation. We miss you, Fran said later. We're a bit shy of sentimentality, but there's something about it. The old fraternity. It's a whole world. Isn't it, father?